But I'm Chris Einwechter. I think I've been here a few times. Amen. It's good to be back. Come on, somebody. The last time I was here on stage with Matt Mayer, we talked about our family and I going out into the harvest as an evangelist. I did do a recent outreach in Deptford where two people came to Christ out of 20, but two, hey man, the Bible says don't despise small beginnings, amen? So it was a 55 and older community. Some guy called me out of the blue and said, hey, I'm just gonna hand out flyers and see if they wanna come hear you speak in my 55 and older community. I'm like, let's do it. 20 people showed up, two people of those 20 gave their lives to Christ, so amen, that's what it's all about. But the, the last time I was here too, I told you about a radio station called Worry Less Radio. It's coming. I'm drinking water from a fire hydrant, but it's coming. May 1st, we should be on the air with some good music, some good preaching, and whatever else God wants to use it for. So thank you for your prayers and support with that. But this morning, I got a word that God has laid on my heart. I want to pray right quick. I'm tired because have you ever heard of a demon-possessed frog because that's what I had in my backyard last night. I was in one o'clock in the morning looking for a frog. No joke, no lie. And if I'd have found that frog, I don't know what I would have did. Let's just say that. But man, when I'm tired, I say stupid stuff. And I got some corny jokes. And I pray that none of that comes out this morning. Amen. And I want to give a shout out to my family. My daughter Lauren had major, major knee surgery. So... She told me she's going to be watching online. Lauren, I love you, and I know God is healing your knee right now. And uh, Lori, thank you for all your support, and my daughter Shelby as well. I wouldn't be able to do it without my family. So, so let's pray. So Lord, thank you again for allowing me to be here at Landmark Church, a church that you're using mightily to advance, to advance, to advance your kingdom. So thank you. But Lord, I need help. Lord, you know that frog last night, and you know everything else, Lord, but I always pray for your help when I preach. There's no way, Lord, that I can do it without you. So somehow, some way, bless my notes and bless my speech. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good to be back at Landmark. The question I want to ask you this morning, have you ever been told or have you ever been trying to change something that wouldn't change? Or have you ever prayed for somebody to change or get free from an addiction or something and you gave up because you said, what's the use, prayer don't work, right? I've been there, <laughs> I've been there. Well, that's what I wanna talk about this morning. I wanna talk about a tool that God gave us that'll change the unchangeable, amen? And if you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles to Colossians chapter four, starting verse two. You're in a good place today because we're gonna talk about something really powerful. So Colossians two, chapter four, and verse two says this. Devote yourselves to what? Amen. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer. Don't just pray, Chris. Devote yourselves to prayer. Verse three, Colossians four. And pray for us too. Listen to this. That God may open a, dear, a door for our message. See, I told you I'm gonna mess up. Deer? No, door. There's no deer here in the Bible. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message. Why? So that we may proclaim, come on, that we may proclaim what? The mystery of Christ, for which I'm in chains, Paul said. That's why I'm locked up, for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. That's a good prayer, isn't it? Pray that I can tell people about Jesus clearly as I should, Paul says. Five, verse five. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Who are outsiders according to the Bible? Those who do not know or have not entered yet into a redeemed relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you know there's people that don't know Jesus? 
There's people probably sitting in here right now that don't know Jesus. There's probably people watching online who don't know Jesus. I was one of those guys who rejected Jesus Christ when you tried to tell me about him. Be wise in the way you walk towards outsiders. Make the most, listen to this, out of every, how many opportunities? Every, man, what if we did this? What if we made the most out of every opportunity? Verse six, finally, let your conversation be always full of what? Grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer every one. Let me pray. Father, bless the reading of your word. Your word, not my word. Bless it in Jesus' name. The Bible has a lot to say, doesn't it? It has a lot to say about putting on Christ, amen? You know, the Bible says that when you give your life to Christ, you become a new what? Isn't that amazing? When you give your life to Christ, you become a new creation. When you give your life to Christ, your zip code gets changed from earth to heaven. The Bible says you literally become a citizen of heaven. You're a dual agent. Amen? And you represent this person called Jesus as a believer in Christ. You're a witness. Can I get a witness? Amen. Right? The Bible says that what we speak to matters. And I wanna to talk to us this morning about how, what's the best way to use our mouth since it's so talked about in the Bible, right? The Bible says what we speak reveals our heart. Did you know that? The Bible says that every idle word we speak is gonna come under what someday? Judgment. Every idle word. Yikes. Right? Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Put it under the blood. The Bible also says a lot about the tongue, the mouth, in other words, we have mouths, they're important, and they make impact, amen? Sometimes good, and what? Sometimes bad, and we're told to walk, as it says in Colossians, with wisdom towards those who are on the outside. You ever been on the outside? Outside means those who are not in a right relationship with God, and we should use our mouths and our minds wisely. Actually, every time we walk out into the world, we should walk in wisdom. If you're in the dry cleaner, you should walk in wisdom. If you're at Wawa, you should walk in wisdom towards those who are on the outside. Amen? You don't have to be a missionary to walk with wisdom towards those who are on the outside. You just got to use wisdom. As the Bible says, he who wins souls is what? Wise. You're a wise person if you win people to Christ. You're a wise person if you support people like Jeff and the church. That's a great way to use your mouth and your mind. Colossians 4.2 again says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful in it. Prayer is the best way to use our mouths, our speech, and our breath. Why? Because prayer is truly what advances the kingdom of God. Amen? Prayer is what brings down heaven to earth. Prayer is the source of power against evil and against the devil. Prayer is what changes the unchangeable. And prayer is the best way to use your mouth. And these verses in Colossians, these Bible verses, are really talking about the best way to advance God's kingdom. And sometimes we forget that. And sometimes we forget this. Think about this. Because you've prayed, you've been forgiven. Because you've prayed at, at times, you've had peace and hope. All because you used your mouth to pray. Right? Because you prayed, you were washed from your sin, from the blood of the Lamb. Because you prayed. That's how it happened. With your mouth. Because you prayed. Prayer is also how we support each other. Amen? Amen? praying for brothers and sisters in Christ going through a hard time, praying upstairs in the upper prayer room on Thursday nights, praying when you see a prayer alert come over the, your email. Prayer is how we support each other. Prayer is the only way you change what refuses to change. And if you look at Colossians 4, 2 through 6, and if you ever wonder what God is concerned about, just look at that passage, and you'll discover that God is concerned about two major things. Our prayer lives and our witness, amen? God is concerned about your prayer life this morning. 
And God is concerned about your witness this morning. How you personally and how I personally represent the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, God is speaking to us through Colossians 4 this morning, saying, please walk with wisdom. Hold your tongue. Put that anger off for a moment. Amen? Walk with wisdom. Right? He's concerned about how we represent him because we represent him. And he says, use wisdom, use grace, use salt, and definitely take the most out of every opportunity so you may, weigh, may win some. Dang. So how's my prayer life this morning? Because when I was writing this, I'm like, whoa. Am I personally representing Jesus Christ the way I should? Am I personally praying the way I need to be praying? And listen, don't worry about those people that are out in the world, those that are called lost. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're sinning. That's what sinners do. And that's what we did before we came to Christ, amen? We should be worried, though, about our prayer lives and about our witness, because if we got a good prayer life and we got a good witness, we're gonna reach those people who are stuck in sin, amen? And right here in Colossians, the apostle Paul is saying to the church, in another version, it says, continue earnestly in prayer. Continue earnestly in what? Prayer. And that we should continue to be, here's a word, vigilant in it. He's talking about being persistent in prayer, a type of prayer life that refuses to back up and shut up. That's the kind of prayer life we see in Colossians 4. We're also told in 1 Thessalonians, what? To pray without what? Amen. Prayer is what changes things. And the word vigilant here in Colossians simply means to stay awake or stay alert. Are we doing that? Right? Are we vigilant? Are we alert? Are we awake in our prayer lives? We need to be, right? Look at the news. Does your prayer life need attention today? I know mine does. Does it need to be vigilant? Are we living in a world today, when we see the news, when we curse the world, we go, look at those fools. Is it a result of a church that has fallen asleep in their prayer life nationwide, worldwide? Yes or no? You tell me. Do you think the church is maximizing its potential with the most powerful thing that God has ever given us, which is prayer? No way. That's the why, that, the why the world is in the condition it's in, for a lack of prayer. Because I could tell you, if we prayed the way God wanted us to pray, if we were devoted to prayer, things would change. Right? There's been a lack of diligence in prayer in the body of Christ over the years. And what does it mean when it says in Colossians to be watchful in it? It means that when we pray, we should be looking for answers. When you pray, you should expect an answer. Some way, somehow. It may not come out the way you're praying, but you should expect God to move, right? Be watchful in it. Look for those results. I think most of us forget that God is a pro-prayer God. He loves prayer. You're not bothering God when you pray. Jesus asked in the garden, hey, watch with me. Pray with me for what? How, how long? One hour. And what happened? They fell asleep. I fell asleep in prayer before. We should pray expecting answers, especially when you read this next verse found in 1 John, or if you know this verse, 514. If we pray anything according to God's will, God what? Hears us. Come on, that's an incredible promise. Chris, if you pray anything according to my will, I hear you. Why don't I take advantage of that? God's will is one of the most powerful assets that you have and that I have. We can change the world on that alone. We can identify things that are God's will that are not happening and pray them down from heaven to earth just because they're God's will. And just because something's God's will doesn't mean it's automatically gonna happen. It needs to be interceded for. It needs to be prayed for. There's a battle in prayer going on in the heavenlies. Amen? Colossians 4 says to do something else in prayer. Be thankful. When we pray, are we thankful? We should be, right? We should be over the top thankful. But we should be thankful that we are allowed to pray, to talk to the Most High God in prayer. Right? Think about that. 
We should be over the top. What a privilege we have in prayer that tends to collect dust at times. What a privilege we have to be able to talk to the Most High God that gets shelved. Amen? And what else in Colossians do we see? Well, it goes on to say that while you're praying, please, by all means, pray that doors may be open so that we can tell others about Christ. You see that in verse 3? Listen, what would the world look like? What would our churches look like if we just prayed that alone? Lord, open doors that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ every day if we prayed that. Lord, open a door today for me to talk to somebody about Jesus. Lord, open doors. Lord, open doors for Christ. Not for me, for Christ. Now, what if every church was praying that? Come on. What would happen? Do you know anybody that's praying that? I don't. Do you know any church that's praying that? What if this church was packed one day, one night, and we just prayed one thing? Lord, open doors for us to talk about Jesus. Amen? Come on, somebody. I was fighting with a frog all night. <laughs> Help me out. What would the world look like if we prayed that alone, open doors? What would it look like? I'll tell you what it would look like. Doors would fly open. Why? Because it's God's will. 1 John 5, 14. If we pray anything according to God's will, he hears us. God says, you should have confidence when you approach me, it says in that verse. Have confidence when you come to me. I'm your father. I'm the Lord. I can change anything, but I don't do anything but by prayer. That's why I command you to devote yourself to prayer. That's why I tell you, I could just flip a switch and go out into the harvest and win people to Christ. God could do it, but what does he say instead? Pray that I send laborers. Why do we got to pray, Lord? Just send them. Because Satan's on the other side going like this. You ain't sending anybody today. You ain't sending Jeff. Chris, you're not leaving and going out into the harvest field. You're not doing it today. I'm going to put so many obstacles in your way and thoughts in your mind. I'm going to discourage you night and day because you ain't praying night and day. That's why we got to pray. Because we got to defeat the enemy of our souls. Amen? Listen. There are people dying right now in car accidents, in hospitals, every second, look up the stats, that don't know Jesus. It's a fact. We got to pray. We got to stop playing around. Amen? And we got to pray for people, this lost and dying world, to not stop sinning. Don't worry about what they're doing. Pray that a door opens that you may be able to talk to them about your Savior. Right? This is a wake-up call, a prayer wake-up call this morning. What about the early church in the book of Acts? What did they think about prayer? Listen, they created a group of men called deacons because of prayer. Do you know that? Acts 6.4 says this, but we will give ourselves continually to what? To prayer, that's the leaders of the church. If you're a leader in this church this morning, if you're a leader in any church, you should be devoted to prayer. And let the deacons do what they do. That's why deacons were created, so people can pray, not the other way around. Isn't that crazy? We got it all twisted sometimes. God says, form a group, call them deacons. Let them be holy men who are full of the Holy Spirit. Why, Lord? So you can pray. Stop playing around, Chris. Let these guys do the work. You get on your knees and you pray heaven down from earth. Then we'll get some work done. Wow. That's why you created deacons? That's why I created deacons. Why'd you create prayer, Lord? To shake the foundations of the earth and reveal my son against pressure from the enemy. Because prayer is what breaks the back of the devil. So what's the best way to use your mouth? Prayer. And I heard people say this, man, smoking calms me down, or other things. And I know it can be tough to quit smoking, but fervent prayer 
brings breakthroughs and destroys the work of the devil. And if you're really looking for peace, and if you're really looking for your nerves to calm down, you should try prayer. Amen? And your nerves, listen, I'm not gonna say that when you smoke a cigarette, your nerves don't calm down. It's probably a scientific thing that happens in your body. But I'm here to tell you this morning that when you pray, your nerves might respond to smoke in a cigarette. But when you pray, God responds. Amen? What would you rather have, your nerves responding or God responding? Amen. I remember I got a phone call from a grandma one morning. She's in Philadelphia. I'm in Jersey. Call me, crying, hysterical. Couldn't even understand her. She said that she's about to lose her grandbaby because her daughter's in prostitution, her daughter's involved in drugs, and they're going to court. The other grandmom is taking the whole show to court, and they're going to win custody of this little baby, rightfully so, probably, right, from the mom. I don't know. She's crying. She's like, what do I do? You know what I said? I don't know what to do. That's what I said on the phone. But pray. And so I just started praying. I said, Lord. I pray to you make a way for this grandma to be able to see her baby. I pray in the name of Jesus that you do miracles in Jesus' name. And then when I hung up, or before I hung up, hello, I felt led to say to her, the first, not the second, not the third, not the fourth, the first attorney's office that you see in Philly, you pull into that parking lot, you go into that attorney's office, and you tell them your situation, and you share your heart. And she did that, and they made her give her a $600 down payment, and they went to court, and she wound up winning every other weekend and every summer for the rest of that baby's life. Amen. Amen. That's not the best part. $2,000 it cost. She put a $600 payment down. You know what the attorney said at the court, in the courtroom, to her when the court was over? You know that $1,600? Forget about it, as they say in North Jersey. That's God. Amen. We cried out to God and God responded. Amen? Prayer is what breaks the back of the devil. Let's get back to praying. Amen? Let's wake up together to the power of prayer. Just imagine if you looked on your calendar on your iPhone and you saw you had an upcoming appointment with God because that's what you have when you pray. You got an appointment with the almighty God. You're allowed to pray because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is amazing to me. An appointment with God. Man. Listen, God's not bothered when we pray. He's bothered when we don't. And most of us, we're honest, our prayer lives are hot and cold depending on what's going on in our lives. If everything's fine in your life this morning, I'm probably not even speaking, speaking to you. I'm probably not even penetrating your heart or the Holy Spirit's not. If everything's good, you got money in the bank, you got a good job, you got a good marriage, you got no kids with any addictions, you got no problems. You ain't got no tree frogs crying at one in the morning. But if you're hurting and you're suffering and you need a breakthrough, I bet you your prayer life is headed in the right direction. Isn't that a shame? I'm guilty of it too, amen? We should be praying without ceasing, the Bible says. We should be devoted to prayer. And when our prayer lives suffer, what else suffers? Based on what you learned this morning, the kingdom of God suffers. The church is asleep worldwide when it comes to prayer, amen? Or we'd be seeing a lot of different things happen in the news. The kingdom of God suffers and the gospel shuts down for a lack of prayer. God said, pray that I send laborers to the harvest for lost souls, for a ripe and ready harvest. God didn't say Google it. He said pray about it, right? Heck no, he said pray without ceasing. And thus the reason we don't see any change taking place in our lives. We don't see the power of God dropping out of heaven. We don't see any stories of answered prayer. And therefore, God is ripped off and his glory stolen because of a lack of prayer. You know who gets glorified when you got an answer to prayer? God. God gets glory from answers to prayer. We don't pray, nothing changes, especially the unchangeable. And when it comes to change, it's something that refuses to change. Jesus, let me say that word again. Jesus said, 
Jesus said. Two different stories in the Bible. Both are about being persistent in prayer, which is what the Bible says to do in Colossians 4. The word continue in prayer in verse 2 is built on the root meaning to be strong. Right? And that is the passage implies persistence and fervor. And it says in other versions in Colossians 2, continue earnestly in prayer, which literally means this, apply great effort continuously. That's what Spurgeon said. Man, am I praying like that? Applying great effort continuously in my prayer life? That's what it means to earnestly continue in prayer. A prayer life that won't stop or shut up or back off. And that's the type of effort that doesn't come easy, amen? We know that because there's a lack of persistence in prayer, right? But Jesus spoke about the power of being persistent in prayer, once in Luke 11 and another time in Luke 18. In Luke 18, he talks about a widow and an unjust judge, and the widow's only weapon was to be persistent, to be a pest. And what happened? What happened to a judge who's powerful and wicked who said, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. I don't care who you are. I don't fear God, and I don't respect people. That's what this judge said if you read Luke 18. How many of you are familiar with the passage? Listen, what did the judge do in the end? He granted her something he refused to do. Prayer changes the unchangeable. What about Luke 11? A friend goes to another friend at midnight. I got somebody that stopped at my house. We need some food. You're my neighbor. I'm coming for a little help. What did his neighbor say? Those of you who know the verse. I'm in bed. My children are in bed. Get away from my door. Right? And then Jesus went on to teach it. And Jesus said he got up for a reason. And it wasn't because he was your friend. He got up because of your persistence. If you take anything from this morning at all, take this. Persistence overcomes resistance. Amen? Persistence overcomes resistance resistance from Satan. Why do you think Jesus taught about persistence in prayer? Why would the Lord, who only had a certain amount of time, a certain amount of years, spoke so much about being persistent in prayer? Because he knows our prayers are resisted. Did you know that? Newsflash, our prayers are resisted by Satan. How do we know that? Daniel, right? Chapter 10, verse 12. Persistence overcomes resistance. If you're praying for a marriage to be fixed, Satan's saying, not today, it ain't. I'm gonna resist it. If you're praying for somebody to get set free from heroin, Satan says, not today, I'm gonna resist it. Everything that's God's will on the earth, Satan resists, including your prayer life. Our prayers are resisted, guys. Do we have Daniel 10? Is that it right there? Wow, you are tired, Chris. You can't get any bigger font than that. <laughs> read it with me then. Let's read this. Mm. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the what? First day. First day. Isn't that important? You're praying. You're praying for somebody to get set free from addiction. You don't see no change. You're praying for a marriage. You're praying for your finances, and you don't see nothing happen. Oh, Crest English. Some of you got that. I know Sean, Sean, here, Sean got that, my, my fellow trooper and Ocrest graduate. <clears throat> Listen, oh, we better read the verse. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray, first day you began to Google, oh, there's Ocrest again. Pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your request has been heard where? Holy smoke. You humbled yourself before God. You began to pray on the first day, Daniel. I'm an angel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. And I'm telling you, bro, on the first day you prayed, you were heard in heaven. And I have come because you spent time Googling stuff. No, I came as an answer to your, I came because you prayed, bro. Verse 13 of the same chapter, if we have it. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, otherwise known as the devil, blocked my way. What? The devil, in response to Daniel's prayer, said, not today, Daniel. I'm a good wrestler, and I'm going to wrestle with that angel. And for 21 days, an angel wrestled with the devil. And we don't think we got to be persistent in prayer? We don't think we got to pray? 
We could have kept the devil on the bench if we didn't pray, but we at least got him off the bench. And look, then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there. Whew. Go ahead, Mike, you got this one, bro. With the spirit prince of the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Mm. I left him there. But he came to help me. And I think it goes on to say, do I get any more of that? Nope. <laughs> Dang, I'm tired. I have come in an answer to your what? Come on, somebody. Is this the church of Jesus Christ or am I somewhere else? <laughs> Amen. I have come in an answer to your prayer. Chris, I've come in an answer to your prayer. Man, that's the words I want to hear. Right? But then Michael, one of the archangels, came, otherwise known as the devil, the prince of Persia, who held an angel up, who responded to the devil's prayer. Man, I have come in response to your prayer, Daniel. Not your Google search, not your cigarette break, nor anything else. No, I fought the devil, man, for days. And I'm standing here in front of you, Daniel, because you prayed. Woo! Man, are you being resisted today? What's the antidote? Persistence in prayer. Amen? Luke 18, 1. Jesus said we ought to always what? Pray and never give up. Pray and never give up. What's that look like? That looks like a door to me. Can I use that door? Mayor, where are you at? Can I use that? Can I get some help? And bring that door right here. I got something for that door. I got something for the devil, too. What do we got back here? Oh, here it is. This is good old Maze Landing something. Yeah. Listen. Thank you, brother. It was unlocked. No, we're locking that door. <sighs> Listen, I got picked to be on a team one time in the state police. I said, Chris, we need you for three months. What you need me for, sir? We need you to effectuate the arrest of 50 people who are involved in child pornography from the top of New Jersey to the bottom. It's an attorney general initiative, and you're one of the guys we're going to use, and you're going to be in charge of a squad, and you're going to roam the state of New Jersey, and we don't want to hear from you until you've got 50 guys under arrest, and you've got 50 search warrants already done by the, by the attorney general's office. Here they are. Bam. Go do surveillance on 50 houses and lock up 50 guys because they were all guys. And I said, wow. So I got my squad together, did the surveillance. I did 50. I was involved with 50 arrests, guys. The first time in my career. And sometimes when you're on a SWAT team, because this is what this prayer stuff reminds me of, a SWAT team who are laser focused. Sometimes when a SWAT team goes up to a door, I'm going to be honest with you. The door don't open, right? Sean, my fellow trooper, what if a trooper turns around at a search warrant at 5 o'clock in the morning and says to the Sarge, Sarge, door ain't opening. You want me to quit? Now, Sean, don't say what that Sarge would really say in church. <laughs> we know what the guy's going to say. Curse words and all. He's going to say, hit that door, troop. Don't give up. What, are you kidding me? Either get out of the way, give me another trooper, and hit that door. That's exactly what he would say. Or give me the battering ram and let me hit the door. Amen? But sometimes when we go up to a door in prayer and we're praying for our children, we're praying for our marriage, we're praying, the door's not opening, guys. Right? Lord, it's Chris. I'm praying, Lord, but prayer don't look like it's working. Do you want me to quit? What do you think Jesus would say to me in that moment? He's already said it in Luke 18, 1. Men always ought to pray and never give up. Amen? And if you know God doesn't want you to quit, and you know that this morning because I read the verse to you, don't you quit. There's somebody watching this message right now or maybe going to watch it later. This is what I believe God laid in my heart. Somebody is on the verge of quitting. You're either going to quit your life, you're going to quit your marriage, you're going to quit something. Don't you quit. 
Instead, apply persistence to that resistance and you cry out day and night. That's your secret weapon. Jesus said in verse seven of Luke 18, you know what he said? He said, how much more, talking about the judge, the judge just relieved the widow. He goes, but how much more will God avenge his own elect who do two things, cry out to God day and night? Find me somebody that prays persistently and you're gonna have somebody that has stories of answered prayer. But you find me somebody that's crying out to God day and night and you have found somebody that's got breakthroughs in prayer, amen? There's a difference. Jesus said, cry out day and night and watch what God does. That's what Jesus said. So sometimes you're gonna go to that door. You're gonna be like, oh, snap. <laughs> God went ahead of me. You know what? It won't last. I got you. It won't Stand last. behind her, hold her shut. Yes, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I don't know what the insurance policy is here. But look, I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna do when you're persistent in prayer. You're gonna bust right through that door of resistance in the name of Jesus Christ, amen? amen. Thank you. Sean, you want this back? I'm just kidding. Listen, that's how we're supposed to apply persistence. The door will open. It may not look like it's gonna open. Oh, but it'll open. There ain't too many things that can withstand persistent prayer in the name of Jesus. And listen, I wanna challenge you guys this morning. I got a prayer challenge coming up May 1st. Only two men on the earth that I have ever prayed with for 40 days and signed a contract. John Shirk and Chris Jones, who's now a pastor at Mission Point Church. But I'm opening it up to you guys. If you wanna pray with me, you don't have to come visit me. It ain't gonna cost you nothing. And you could do it at your home. But I'm gonna send you an email every day for 40 days straight about prayer. And we're gonna pray morning and night for your breakthrough and for my breakthrough. And if you could bring that slide up, right there, QR code, oh snap. Pro prayer, because God is a pro prayer God, right? I got a little website, proprayer.com. Scan that, and I know Satan's gonna say, not today, I'm telling you, this will change your life. It's only 40 days, it ain't gonna kill you. You hear me? I hope you guys sign up on an email so I can send you back an email for 40 days and challenge you to pray like you've never prayed before. It'll be a flyer in the lobby with the same thing on it. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. You can move that door if you guys want because we're gonna try to bust it again in the sec second service. Thank you, brothers. Let's switch gears and talk about communion and talk about what Jesus has done for us. <sighs> Think about that for a moment. What has Jesus Christ done for us? You guys got the elements? If you gotta go, am I over time? I'm good? Wow, that's good. But we wanna talk about what Jesus has done for us, right? And what has he done? Jesus is a warrior. Jesus came to this earth born of a what? Virgin, why? Because of Adam and Eve, who sinned against God, and the Bible says, pass sin down to what? All men. Everybody born of a woman is born with a sinful nature, thanks to Adam. But Jesus, often referred to as the second Adam, came to this earth, born of a virgin. Did he have a warrant out for him? What did King Herod do to every male-born child two years and under when Jesus was born? Killed him. Jesus experienced resistance on the earth. You know that? He fought every day to make it to that cross. And I remember the day that I was told that Jesus died for me. Because up until that point, I rejected him. But I was in a state police troop car. And another trooper said, sir, if you get shot tonight, what's going to happen to you? And I said, nothing. Because I ain't getting shot tonight. But if I did, I'm a good man. And I think God would receive me and how wrong I was, amen? Nothing can bring forgiveness but the shed, tempted, tempted blood. Jesus went out into a desert for 40 days. Satan was given permission to tempt Jesus like he was given permission to tempt Adam. That's why Jesus was called the second Adam. 
Satan's probably looking back and saying, yeah, you made it this far. You ain't making it out of this desert because I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at you and I'm going to ruin everybody's chance to be forgiven because your blood is not going to remain sinless. And Jesus remained sinless to the degree that when God forgives you because of Jesus and you applying his blood to your account, the Bible says that God looks upon you as if you've never sinned. That's a good deal, amen? You give your life to Christ and Jesus washes you clean and represents you. You're supposed to represent him on earth. Jesus represents you where? In heaven. No matter what you've done. And this trooper told me that, and I went home. I shared it with my wife. I said, look, I met this trooper. Gave me this Bible. Told me about this Jesus. I said, tonight, honey, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. And I got on my knees by my fireplace. My wife got next to me, and we prayed the best way we knew how, because we weren't really keen on praying. And we asked Jesus Christ to forgive us. And the Bible says, when anyone does that, the angels do what? They rejoice. Now, why would an angel rejoice when somebody gives their life to Christ? I'll tell you why. Because it was a free will decision. God can come down here and put me in a headlock anytime he wants and make me serve him. God can put me in a headlock and make me receive Jesus Christ, but it'd be against the rules. They gotta stand back. The message has to be preached about Jesus, and then a decision has to be made, and then they gotta stand. Satan stands and God stands, and they're gonna go, wait. I don't know if you want to set price or not. But when he does, guess what happens? The angels go, dang, he's received Jesus Christ. He's forgiven. He's sealed. He's been given the Holy Spirit. He's now a representative of God on earth. He's now a citizen of heaven. And everything he's done has been erased and forgotten because you, Jesus, refuse to give up. Isn't that amazing? Come on. You know what Jesus said to Martha and Mary when their brother Lazarus died? They gave, out, they gave him a hard time. You remember that? If you would have been here, my brother would have what? He would have lived. You know what Jesus said in response? He said, listen, your brother's going to rise again. He was meaning right then. But his sisters thought, yeah, he's going to rise again on the resurrection day. Whew. This is one of my favorite verses. You know what Jesus said? Come on, somebody. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. You're looking at him. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he's dead, yet shall he live. I don't know about the resurrection, Jesus said. I haven't heard about the resurrection. I am the daggone resurrection, girl. I am God in the flesh of a man who just went at your enemy for your soul, and I went crucified on a cross. I am the resurrection. And if you put your faith in me, you'll never die. Amen. You will never die. I will never die. Sure, I'll die physically, but I ain't dying spiritually. My next breath's going to be with God in heaven. Thanks. I don't know why he did it, man. I don't deserve it. I'm telling you. Nor do you. It's called grace. Unmerited favor. Favor that you don't deserve. Isn't that crazy? And people reject it. I rejected it. I remember people telling me, Maze Landing, about Jesus. I was like, Jesus? What? I'm good. I'm 20 years old, man. I got a Mustang, a gun, and a badge. How little did I know? Amen? Listen, let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to take communion in a moment, but I just think and feel right now. Is there anybody in here today says, Chris, I've never asked Jesus Christ into my life. Not officially. I'm not going to call you up here. I just want you to raise your hand so God will see you and the demons in hell will see you. Take a stand for Christ this morning. Is there anybody in this room that says, I want to give my life to Christ? Raise your hand right now. Anyone? Is there anybody in here? Just raise your hand. Is there anybody online? Raise your hand. And just repeat this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Today, Lord, as an act of my choice, my will, I receive you as my Lord and 
my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there anybody that prayed that prayer? I can barely see. But if you prayed that prayer, you're forgiven, adopted, and you now know God as a Father. Amen? Amen. So, communion. 1 Corinthians 11. That's what communion is all about, what we just talked about, Jesus. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember, Chris, don't ever get over the honeymoon of me dying for you. And I pray I never will. 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Amen. And then when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you got that cup right now and you're ready, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we talked about what you did this morning. But right now we remember that you did it. You used your body for us for the forgiveness of sins. And we thank you this morning in Jesus' name for your body. Amen. You can partake. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray. Father, forgive us for falling asleep in prayer. Forgive us for not always being a good witness. Forgive us for not always remembering what you've done. But this morning, right here at this church, we remember that your blood was tempted, remained sinless, and then was shed so we can know God as a Father and be fully forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can partake. Amen. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me back. Sign up for that prayer challenge. If anybody's got any questions, I'll be in the lobby. I just want to say that I love you guys, and God bless you.